Uh, Norbert, thanks. So the first thing I had to do is take off my sweater because otherwise everybody asks me for the way around. It's the same blue. Uh, thanks for inviting me here to address you with this opening keynote. Uh, FPL certainly is a conference that has the potential to grow in importance, and I'll be talking about that also. What is the tactile internet and what do I want to talk about? So this is obviously, if you look back, the electronics and wireless electronics has shaped the planet quite a bit. In 2005, this was the election of Pope Benedict at Via della Conciliazione. Everybody was waiting. And if you look at the bottom here, you see one phone. And this is the same scene in 2013. And you see plenty of phones. But these phones are only taking pictures or videos. They're not in the internet, really piping their data somewhere. So there's a huge potential still to see what's going to be happening. That's number one. So if we were able to connect all these cameras into the net, that means we need a huge amount of capacity beyond what we have today. Here you see the data rates and the capacities in Wi-Fi and in cellular that have advanced over the last years. They have doubled every 18 months or grown 10x every five years, which is exactly Moore's law. We see the data rates as they increase over time, and the newest Wi-Fi is obviously 11AC and 11AD and uh, LT Advance is peaking around the corner, coming soon. Now the question obviously is, is there a need for more data rate? Obviously, yes. I mean, if you just connect all those devices, then there's a need. If we go to um, today's stadium in the US, every 10th seat has a Wi-Fi access point be under the seat just to be able to offload all the traffic that is generated in the stadium. So it's not a question, do we need the bandwidth? Do we need the data rate? But the question is, how do we do that? And just to give you an idea, only 10 years from now, we need one terabit per second Wi-Fi. We're happy to have one to 10 gigabits today. We need a terabit 10 years from now, which means three years of research, three years of standardization, three years of product development, then in getting it into the stores. If you don't start research now, you're too late on terabit Wi-Fi. These are things that we need to work on. But obviously, data rate is one thing, and this has been sort of a storyline. Um, when we sold our first startup to Philip Semiconductor, and I was then chief scientist of Philip Semi and had to meet the CTO, and uh, he asked me, why should he invest in cellular? And this is when I said, look here, these are the data rates in cellular as they're going to be increasing. And he said, no way, because that was 2003. And they have been increasing that way. But the question is, is that going to advance? Is Moore's law going to be continuing to be driving the industry? And to give you just a sneak preview on why I strongly believe we're still going to see 20 years of innovation at an exactly the same rate, is just to give you an, uh, one slide on our center, um, which is on highly adaptive energy efficient computing, where we're trying to build the next generation servers. So if we build a server, we have to put chips on a board. Each and every one of these chips has gazillions of processors. It is not only a chip, it is obviously in future a 3D chip stack. Now, if we have all those processors sitting here, what is the big bottleneck to make such a computer? It is not stacking multiple chips on top of each other. Yes, that obviously is also a bottleneck. But if you have all these cores with their workload, it is about connecting them. It's about a communications challenge. So how do we actually build a communications fabric, for example, an all optical interconnect, to make sure, with embedded waveguides, to make sure that we can actually deliver the bandwidth between the different chips on a board that we need? But who wants to build a computer with one board? 
We want multiple boards. And if we look at the bandwidth of the backplane today, a high-speed backplane today has up to 300 gigabit per second. If we're talking about something like this, we need up to a petabit per second backplane. So how do we get that? And our answer is no problem. Oops, sorry, no problem. We just go ahead and we connect these backplanes with a wireless backplane where each chip has antenna arrays on it and actually have beam forming antennas and 100 gigabit is what we've been working on now. Now we're working uh, up to now, now working on terabit links at a carrier frequency of 220 gigahertz, which obviously is possible if you look like at IHP's SIGI HBT process or other SIGI HBT processes, we can actually implement these kind of structures in a 3D chip stack very nicely. So I'm here to tell you this is going to be possible. We're going to be able to build base stations, compute systems, whatever all, with a petabit backplane. So now the question is, obviously, which this conference has to address, how to build a system such that we can actually run and program these huge amount of processor cores. What is the amount of processor cores we can expect? The amount of processor cores we can expect is the following. Let's assume we have four boards with four by four chip stacks on each side. And we have uh, so two boards, double-sided, four by four chip stack on the board, four boards in a box, 128 chips, stacked on top of each, uh, each other in 3D. Yes, my iPhone has 16 chips stacked on top of each other for the flash memory alone. So I'm not asking for much more than we have today. And 128K processors, not x86 style, uh, big guys, but like a CUDA core or things like that, small cores. Then we have a an array of cores, which by the way, fits into one liter volume and is about 16,000 chips, 8,000 processors, 8,000 memory chips, a billion cores. This is an exascale computer in a liter volume. That's what our research project is about. And we truly believe this is going to be feasible. That's 100,000 times more performance than today in one liter at a kilowatt power which means we have to build systems thinking 25 years ahead, because 10x is five years time. So this is a system that is going to be possible maybe 25 years from now. There are multiple steps still on the way. So if you think you can rest in peace because Moore's law is coming to an end, just think of 3D integration and this kind of structures, we know for the next 25 years we still have the heartbeat of Moore's Law driving electronics. Good news for all PhD students, obviously. But now the question is, why do we need that amount of compute power? Data rate, I said, just connect those cameras. Then we need terabits. Compute power, why do we need this amount of compute power? And is data rate and compute power the only thing? And I'm here to tell you there's a revolution waiting to be happening. It's happening already right now in technology, which we name the tactile internet, that is going to change the planet. What is it about? So I went about, started maybe five years ago, to talk to physiologists and psychologists and said, if data it is not it, what is actually the cool thing that happened with Apple's first iPhone, this is not the first one, Apple's first iPhone, when they introduced it to the market. And what is the next thing we can expect that people really want? So if we look at this thing, yes, and they were the first to come up with the idea you can hold it whatever, whichever way you want, there are sensors in there, and they move the display text accordingly. So what is it about? sensors and human interaction. And the other thing was these sensors were made available to an app programmer so that they could come up with crazy new applications beyond just a data pipe. You had all the sensors for human interaction. And why did the stock price of Apple 
go down by 3 dB, as we, tell, we say as communications guys, or went down by 50% when the Apple iPhone 5 was introduced, because the new sensor here, the fingerprint sensor, was all the, that was in there, and it was not even opened up to app developers. So there was no real new value. So what we have to understand, it's about human-machine interaction that sort of makes big changes. If we move an object, what is the interaction we want to have? What is the reaction time we want to have? If we want to move an object, we want to see this object actually having moved within what time? If we do it by hand or if we do it virtually? It is one millisecond. So if you put VR goggles on and move your head and the displays don't move within a millisecond, according to your head movement, you get sick to your stomach. It's called cyber sickness. You know that from a boat, that's seasickness, or from a pendolino train, uh, that's train sickness, whatever it is. Yes, this is cyber sickness. Our eye expects a reaction if we start moving something within a millisecond. That is also why if you move a mouse over a screen, yes, even though the screen refresh rate is 100 hertz, it's only every 10 milliseconds. So you see it hopping around. You can actually see it hopping around. If you watch a movie, you're so immersed in the story, you don't see that. But if you, you as a person start moving an object, then you see the mouse hopping around. Yes. And if you're watching whatever kind of movie and you see a big explosion, for you, this is one moving image. You don't actually see it hopping because you don't have the human visual interaction. So if we want to have moving, um, want to move virtual or real objects, we need to get today's best latency in LTE, fourth generation cellular, down to one millisecond from 25. That's a huge step, big step. And I'll talk about that in a second. Gamers know this, right? I mean, they come up with these kind of scenarios. Why? Because the speed of light is, as a wireless engineer, I tell you, one of the biggest challenges we have because it's so slow. Yes, light travels only 300 kilometers in a millisecond. That is not far. So if you want to have these gaming parties, and the gaming industry is built around a 10 millisecond reaction time, you need to really come close together, otherwise you cannot do internet gaming that is fun. Let's look at a new application. Go back to stadiums, World Cup. If you have a stadium, this is the stadium of this little city here, uh, of Munich, you have 80,000 people sitting in this stadium, and they all have cell phones today, tomorrow they might have glasses. What does that mean? 80,000 cameras. If I now have a look at these cameras in a very different way, if I say, okay, I connect all these cameras to a rendering engine, and this rendering engine then can basically calculate any viewpoint you want from any grass sitting here in the field and you can watch the game from any viewpoint on the planet. If you say, actually, here's my favorite player, and I want to watch it from his viewpoint, no problem. The rendering engine can in real time just bring this into your glasses and you watch this, it's called free viewpoint video. And if you say, this player is moving too slowly, I want to go at the speed of 200 kilometers per hour, you choose the ball, and there you see the game out of the viewpoint of the wall, and you're kicked over the field at 200 kilometers per hour. Obviously, this here needs something. If you're sitting here and this is displayed in your glasses at an interaction, it's not you moving your head. So in this case, a possibly up to 10 millisecond latency is, is uh, allowable, but it's certainly not more than 10 millisecond latency allowable. Otherwise, you get an asynchronous feeling of what is happening on the field compared to what you see in your goggles. And if you think of this application, and you have seen Formula One races, and Formula One races are really boring, except if they turn on the camera that is mounted to one of the cars. Or even worse, if you've watched downhill mountain biking, 
and you see these head-mounted camera viewpoints, I mean, that's, that's when you get wet hands, right? It's scary. So this is a huge application market all over the place, not only for sports, but also for performances, for whatever all. Let's have a look at a sec another application um, where we need this tactile speed of less than 10 millisecond up to one. Here we need actually one millisecond. If you want to control these robots in a hazardous environment, you have a joystick. And if you ever have done that, it is really cumbersome. It takes months and months of practice time to seriously be able to control one of these robots. It would be very nice and very easy if we had a humanoid robot sitting there, just copying our movements. We have our goggles on, this robot walks into the scene and cleans up everything. If there's a suitcase left in an airport, just have the, you as an extension, your humanoid robot, walk into the scene, open the suitcase, nobody is going to be harmed. The only thing that could be harmed is this robot, that's it. And you don't have to do all the big action that's done today. Cleaning up Fukushima, whatever you want to do, thinking of all the different scenarios. But obviously, if you look at how it's done today, also with these things, it's slow motion. But in these hazardous environments, it does happen that I drop something, I have to catch it quickly. Right? I have to react. I need this one millisecond tactile feedback so that this robot really is an extension of myself. And if I do that, I can actually also change the whole care industry. Going from today, from what has been done yesterday, to what is being happening today, oops, to tomorrow, where we then have humanoid robots sitting next to us when I'm 90 year old, laying in bed. I don't want to have, wear, have to wear a diaper because I have to wait for three hours for the care person to come by. I want to have that humanoid robot sitting next to me and I call 1-800 take over my robot and somebody is there talking to me, picks me out of bed, takes me to the bathroom, whatever, all I, any care I need. So this is basically going to revolutionize the whole care industry. But we need tactile feedback at a millisecond rate. Let's talk a, another industry that's going to be changed completely by the tactile internet, which is manufacturing. A hundred years ago, Henry Ford invented the assembly line. It is very good at manufacturing one product. Just think of the price of a Rolls Royce. So if we hadn't invented the, ma the assembly line as humankind today, if that was not available, nobody could afford a car that's sitting here, or let's say, I, I guess almost nobody here can afford a car then. So it has made mass production has ma on assembly lines, has made luxury items affordable to anybody, but they're not individualized. So now the big trend is towards individualization. Everybody wants their little different tweaks and belts and twists. So if you have an, a convertible being manufactured on this assembly line, some of these robots are idle 99% of the time on only doing something when the convertible comes by. That is not cost efficient. So we have to change manufacturing completely. The assembly line is something of yesterday for these individualized products. We have to go to assembly stations where we have robots whizzing around on the ceiling and the floor and bringing the parts on time, in time to the assembly station such that you can design. If you say, I want this tweak on the car and I want this thing there or I want a different suit, uh, if you go to a boutique and buy your suit, whatever, all everything manufactured to the customer's need and the individualization. A huge chance for new uh, employment opportunities also in the service and customization industry. Now let's work, walk one, f let's have a look at yet another industry that can be revolutionized by the tactile internet. This is actually Mobility. If we look at this street, it's an intersection, two intersections in the downtown area. We have a person sitting here that wants to walk along the street. What is the issue? We put in traffic lights, right? Traffic lights generate what? 
traffic lights generate the need for making these streets very wide because we need parking space for the cars to be parking in front of the red lights. Yeah, the buffers. As a communications guy, these are buffers. There's a buffering and a queuing problem. So, how could we change that completely, make the efficiency much higher, save a lot of energy, and at the same time take away the chance of having accidents is by taking away the traffic lights and taking over the mobility of the cars by a centralized controlled infrastructure. And they just whizzed. And if this guy wants to cross the street, he has a personal bubble and there is no reason anybody should hit this person because, or hit a frog, yes, because once you have the personal bubble turned on, then you actually are part of the system and the cars whiz around you. So that's going to completely change our way of looking at mobility. There's no way you're going to be able to drive in downtown areas in future yourself. It's all going to be taken over by an automated system. But it's not going to be an autonomous system. An autonomous system with every car driving autonomously does not deal with this bicyclist, the pedestrian and all the others in the traffic and making sure that they can cross the road. So if we look at this scenario, we see that what we have seen up to today, fourth generation cellular, was about content communication, moving video, voice, data, anything of that kind. The communication of tomorrow is about taking over virtual and real objects and steering and controlling them. This is a completely new world. And the application areas, I just showed a couple, I mean, the areas there are humongous. The markets are huge. I'll talk about that in the end. To understand these different scenarios, we have to start working and understand because it's very fragmented. If you look at what's needed for mobility, it might be very different than what's needed for manufacturing. So we put together this big project here, um, working, for example, with these industrial automation guys or the airplane guys or the train guys or the motorcycle airbag guys or whatever you have here to understand the needs in terms of computing and communication to make sure that we have the specs right to make the tactile internet happen. Let's have a look now at a hardware implication. If we want to go from a sensor to an actuator which is sitting somewhere else within a millisecond to a hosted computer then, obviously, speed of light means that this cannot be more than 300 kilometers, which means the sensor cannot be farther away than 150 kilometers from the computing engine. Adding packetization and whatever all, we're around in the range of 10 kilometers, maybe 10 miles. So we're talking about localized computing to make this happen. What does that mean? That means also that we have to look at the receiver station, which today is a, a base station full of FPGAs and DSPs, and a hosted computer decider being merged because any loss in, because every cable here means latency, and latency is bad. So a cloud computer controlling such an object sitting in Alaska is not going to be possible. I live in Dresden, the nearest Google server farm is in Krakow. There's no way we can go the 300 kilometers to Krakow and back to have an application run in Dresden. So this has to be local. We need the mobile edge cloud, and actually we need to have that possibly even in one piece of silicon. The other thing, obviously, if you look at it, means the latency on the air interface has to be maybe 100 microsecond. If you look at LTE, 4G, every bit today in the fanciest, most advanced cellular system is 70 microseconds long. There's no way we can manage to have 100 microseconds. Fill a packet, transmit a packet, detect a packet, decode a packet. We have to go to yet another cellular system. Let's talk about the computing part. So what do we see? Our proposal is to go to a dual engine concept where we actually have one memory sitting there in each and every one of these dual PEs, and of this memory is a DSP and a microprocessor. 
So with, by doing this, we can gain a lot. We can, this guy, every clock cycle can change to, from a DSP to a microprocessor and back. It's not a reconfigurable processor. It's two processors sitting off the same engine, uh, same memory. Why? Because the memory dominates anyway. 80 to 90% of the silicon is memory, so who cares if we put two processor cores below one piece of memory? You can build extremely low power solutions. And what is the big challenge here? The challenge is to minimize the data transfers, to minimize the power consumption and the latency. Yes, this is how we get latency and power consumption down. So we have to make sure that we have a DSP and a risk core sitting there next to each other so we can do the signal processing, the demodulation in the first million clock cycles. Then the result is sitting in the memory, then it just swaps its uh, configuration and then it can do control processing, protocol stack processing and the control engine running on top and then go back again to signal processing to build the packet to then transmit the data. So yes, this is heterogeneous, but heterogeneous designed for super low power and super low latency. Um, so this is basically how we do this and generate this. So here is a different way of looking at this block diagram. We presented this at ISSCC this year, just to give you an idea of how we approach this with these dual processing engines in a network on chip, and then we still have application-specific accelerators for forward error correction, uh, sphere detection, and other things sitting on this chip to build the whole complete engine. So what does that mean? That means we also obviously don't need an FPGA interface. At some point in time, we need embedded FPGA. Where? Not on chip, but in the chip stack. It's a 3D chip stack, so why even care about embedding FPGA in here? I just put another chip between the two processor chips, that is FPGA. So that's sort of the heterogeneity that makes most sense in terms of silicon die cost of the complete solution. At least that's the way we believe the ways forward. Then if you handle this kind of system, we call it a field programmable processor array. Yes, if we want to handle a field programmable processor array, we then have to also have a way of actually programming this. And the way we do this is by looking at the software application, its task graph, have a runtime engine, the core manager, that does all the task scheduling and configuration on time, in time. So you have these tasks coming in and does out of order execution, scheduling and everything coming in here to then load the whole processor field with either the accelerators or the uh, configurable cores or dual PEs to make sure that they're a DSP or a microprocessor depending upon what's currently being needed. And by doing this, we can actually load this engine and it doesn't matter if we have eight dual PEs or if we turn off one and it's because one has broken or whatever all or we want to save the energy, we can dynamically load this whole engine in a dynamic fashion. Maybe that should, would be too... You can build a very efficient core manager. That's what this slide is about. I just have to make sure that this... Uh, the battery seems to be... So, what does that mean? Based on the application requirement, we can have basically this highly dynamic configuration, but also in terms of power management, yes? So, Start and end times, target frequency, voltage level for frequency, for, uh, voltage level for each and every processing element has to be completely individually controlled. And then we, on the core screen, have a global AVFS, AVS. So just to give you an idea of how this can be done, what I think is important for this future vision of field programmable process arrays in such a hack box, as we call this, this billion core computer engine, here we have three power rails at different power levels so that we can clock this at single frequency, double frequency, quadruple frequency, and we can switch between these three levels within very short times and moderate the levels at a slow AVS adaption, as is known today. If you look at the rate at which we can actually switch from 100 megahertz to a 200 megahertz version, for example, it's in within 20 nanoseconds on this chip. 
so that we can really adapt very nicely and we can show running applications that we actually gain exactly like the theory shows, the 2x power uh, energy consumption advantage by having this dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. Then maybe that goes into more detail, forward air correction unit, etc. I'll, I'll give you a PDF of these slides to, to basically show you uh, that you can offload off the website later. But here you see the different versions. Uh, this is our newest chip, our field programmable processor array, which clearly has quite a lot of operating performance, same die size as a Magali chip, but greatly reduced uh, power consumption, 480 milliwatts at full speed, everything running, but with a dynamic voltage and frequency scale, and typically running at 150 milliwatts. So what did I want to tell you here quickly is that merging computing and communications is an issue for making the tactile internet happen. It's about dynamic configuration management. We need processing elements as needed in time, flexibly configure as needed. And memory and communications dominates our architecture. Who cares about wasting a gate? I mean, dark silicon has been around for 20 years. Yes, so who cares about gates not being used? Uh, it's about the memory not being used because that dominates the silicon. So that's where you have to basically optimize the whole thing. It's about low power, low latency, and high performance. Then we can make this tactile internet vision happen. Uh, no, this one. Now let's go and have a look at what this means in terms of transmission. We need not only these compute engines, we need, as I mentioned, a new way of communicating bits. What is it that we need? It has to be scalable in bandwidth because we want, sometimes there's frequency available in the spectrum of 100 megahertz, sometimes one megahertz, sometimes four megahertz, depending upon where you look. So we need something that can scale in bandwidth dynamically. LTE already has a lot of that. We want to reuse the whole clocking scheme because if you look at today's technology, we have an LTE available with more than 30 frequency bands worldwide. And if you ever have designed a terminal chipset, you know what the hassle it is to design the clocking and interference scheme just to build a hardware board. To re so we want to make sure that we can reuse the LTE clocking scheme. Then we want to be able to address fragmented spectrum. We have spectrum that is blocked, the orange one, and the blue one that is available. It's discontinuous spectrum. Even if you look at just the LTE auctioning, some of the companies got discontinuous spectrum at the 1.8 gigahertz band, etc. So we need to be able to address this. What does that mean? I need to build a sharp filter here, a sharp filter here, a sharp filter here with at least 60 dB attenuation. A lot of single processing power? No. Today it's done in with discrete saw filter components. Very costly, power consumption, because the filter uh, insertion loss is there. So that's not really a cool idea. And the last thing, that, oops, the last thing we need to do is also we need to be able to have the air interface work asynchronously. So parts of the frequency are blocked in time and spectrum and we have to basically run around there. So today, for those that are in modulation, just one slide on that. Today we have so-called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing where we have multiple subcarriers in time. And then we take basically the intersymbol interference of, the, of our channel. We have n subcarriers and time samples and then put in the cyclic prefix, yes? And that's why we have all this FFT processing. If you look at Wi-Fi, if you look at LTE, if you look at DVB-T, uh, etc. We have a lot of FFT single processing in all modern modems. Because this you can basically uh, signal the single processing entails here a lot of FFTs. Then in the uplink of LTE we have also single carrier frequency division multiplexing where we have a lot of bits stacked in series and then we do the same thing put a cyclic prefix here for demodulation purposes. 
And what we propose here as an alternative sitting in the middle is actually say, we want to have multi-care for this frequency agility, but we want to shape this. And what we have now here is for each subcare, we have multiple bits, multiple symbols, like three in this case, four subcarriers, three symbols. So now we can do actually spectral engineering, spectral shaping. We can filter this cyclically. And then we have something which we can then copy there. This we call generalized frequency division multiplexing. Does this work? We can show it works in the lab. Here you see a GFDM with more than 60 dB attenuation, the black line. The OFDM is this guy with 13 dB to, to 18 dB attenuation. So in OFDM, we have to put in all these soft filter components, discrete filter components. With GFDM, yes, it needs at least three times more single processing power, but we can actually uh, build these modems very nicely. Now, if you say this is very nice that this exists, but maybe this does not work in practice, here it is to show you that it actually runs outside. We can show, look here you see an LTE uh, signal, and then here you see the block shape the, in the frequency of a GFTM signal, which shows the big advantages of this. Here's the rickshaw mobile terminal uh, that we have. This is on top of our building. And uh, you see basically here, this is in the lab, and here you see my PhD student driving the rickshaw, showing that this can be done in real time. Because if you do these kind of systems, it's always not only about showing that the math works. In the end, if you put in all the analog components, you have to show that it really shows the spectral properties. Okay, now I still want to touch one topic, which is resilience, which is becoming more and more important and is of utmost important to make the tactile internet happen. Why? If you look at the different applications, we see traffic and safety needs an availability in time of 99.999%. Other way of looking at it, an outage of 10 to the minus 5. So if we look at this, it's a challenge. Industrial automation, these guys want eight nines. 10 to the minus 8. Telesurgery, 5 nines. Energy communication, smart grid, also 5 nines. Why is that a challenge? Today's wireless systems, yes, if you take your cell phone and actually measure the performance, how often are you connected to the network continuously? There is no continuous connection because they're so called fading. There's fading on the wireless channel that uh, once in a while, the reflections that you have just lead to a notch and you have no reception. And this once in a while in a system like this is in a very well configured network, you have a 3% outage. That means an availability of 97% of the time. 97% of the time, or let's put it other way around, 3% outage means more than 40 minutes a day your packets are lost. You don't notice it because we're only talking about content communication, not about controlling objects. But if we control objects and we lose the objects 40 minutes a day, that's not a good idea. So the big question that was there uh, like two years ago, people said, but Gerhard, this is not possible, your nice vision was well, because of this 3% outage. Yes, we have a 3% outage on a wireless link. So forget about controlling any objects. The good news is this here is a fading statistics that depends very much the interference you have from multiple echoes and your notches depend upon the carrier frequency you use. If I use a carrier frequency of 900 megahertz and then I use a second one at 1.8 gigahertz, they fade completely independently. So what does that mean? I just take a second connection. Yes, I double the data rate, take a second connection. If they're independent, I'm down to 10 to minus 3. If I say, I don't trust that base station, I take a third connection with a second base station, etc., 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 and we, then we get down to 
extremely low outage rates. So the good news is physics does make it possible to build wireless links that are as good, if not better, than cables. But today, we do exactly this. This is called coordinated multipoint and carrier aggregation. We connect to multiple base stations for LT Advanced, so not in today's 4G networks, but in LT Advanced. And we have carrier ag aggregation. For what reason? To increase the data rate. So we have to just use exactly the same technology that we developed, like in this big test bed uh, in downtown Dresden. We had the world's largest test bed for coordinated multipoint for bad developing exactly this technology. But not for resilience, but for increasing the data rate. But now we have all these tests and measurement results, and we can show that the resilience can be achieved. I just skipped that. So that means good news is latency can be done with generalized frequency division multiplexing. Resilience can be achieved with the techniques of LT advanced. So there's no reason why the tactile internet cannot happen because computing can be achieved by merging computing and communications. We can get the latency down. We have to build a mobile edge cloud. Mobile edge cloud means I have basically such a hack box, a billion cores or whatever it is, sitting in every access point in every base station. That's a lot of silicon. Yes? Thinking of 16,000 chips in every car, in every robot arm, in your bicycle, whatever. Um, and, but these chips in the base stations have to be right there as close as possible to the object to make sure that the millisecond is reached. But not only that, we have another challenge. The challenge is this application is running off this base station. We have to hand off the application. What does that mean? Today we connect to one base station and then this link is switched over to this link and that's a handoff. And if in the protocol something went wrong, then we have a handoff failure, a, a dropped call. Everybody has experienced that. Now, we don't only have to switch a link, the application is running here. The control server is running in the base station. So we have to boot this application in the next server we have to synchronize the states, and then we have to get the handoff done. That's a huge IT research challenge. So what are, we don't have this node talking to this node over some kind of wireless infrastructure. This is how we do it today. We route this network like this in a single path approach. But we actually have multiple base stations we talk to, and we have to have multiple routes such that we can build the resilience. Because the failure chance, the chance of failure of every router here is at least 10 to the minus 5. Yeah, that's the chance of a base station dropping off and you have to reboot it again, and the router and whatever all. And if you want to get an end-to-end -end guarantee of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 8, it becomes a different challenge. We cannot just route a single link. We have to start building network coding into this. And we have to have the distributed computing in here as well. We cannot rely on one compute engine running our service. You have to rely on multiple compute engines plus the handoff challenge. But for us as researchers and our community, this is a playground unheard of, right? Because, I mean, coming up with all these ideas to make this happen is going to keep us busy for at least the next decade, if not a couple decades. So. Um, if you look at these challenges, it's not only about throughput, it is also about latency, sorry, it's about sensing, it's about massive resilience, it's about safety and security. We don't want anybody to take over our car and drive us against a wall. And it's about fractal heterogeneity in the network. If we take all this together, it's something we can research on as wireless people, but that is not it. It's not a wireless channel challenge alone. 
it is a silicon challenge because we really have to understand how to build these silicon systems. Otherwise, we fill this hall just with chips, and then we say that's a terminal. So that's really the connection here. And the third thing is we have to build this mobile edge cloud, merger of computing and communications in an edge cloud server to build these super high performance, low latency, low energy systems. And finally, we have to understand the applications the tactile internet applications to make sure that we set the boundary conditions right. Take, for example, our free viewpoint video. <coughs> we need a terabit connectivity for all these goggles to be connected, at least. But who cares if a frame is lost? No life is threatened. If we have the automotive example, we our data rate is far more reduced. But we have to add a lot of links in parallel, so our data rate is increased again a bit due to this parallel connectivity to make sure that we can achieve the resilience. So it is a trade-off system, and we have to understand where to trade these off such that we don't over-engineer the whole thing and never anything happens. Oops, sorry. So to make this sure that this happens, we have formed the Dresden 5G Lab. Its opening event is pretty soon, and the whole idea is that we professors come together and actually start looking at the silicon, the wireless, the mobile edge cloud, and the tactile internet, and actually work on this together. And uh, we're starting out in Dresden with a, with a Dresden location, understanding these, and then want to pan out, obviously, to further places. Right now, we're more than 500 researchers working on this topic. And uh, we're not only researchers, we love solving equations, we love doing our math, we love designing chips, we love writing software and coming up with new ideas there, but we also are somewhat entrepreneurs. We have generated 25 startups together already uh, in Dresden, all located in Dresden, around these different topics. So I do truly believe the tactile internet will happen. This is a bigger challenge, by the way, than what we can do with our little team in Dresden. There's plenty of challenges around. These are the companies we currently work with. Two have said they love us so much, they want to really see this 5G lab idea pan out and function, and are giving us massive additional support. In conclusions, I hope I showed you that the tactile internet has a chance of happening. Now, I also said it's big. I said there's gazillions of challenges, and I only pointed out a couple of them with a couple very basic solutions. Try to keep all the math and everything out. Now the question is, how big is the market? So Deutsche Telekom Exco, yes, the whole executive board, asked me over for an evening to spend the evening with them talking about this and strategizing. So I had to put together this slide. They said, very nice, but tell me also market sizes. So that's why I said, let's look at German sizes, because Deutsche Telekom is a German company. German ambulatory service is already 35 billion. With a tactile internet, we can at least address, build a 10 billion on top. Manufacturing is at least a 10 billion, just in Germany. Events, concerts, sports, music events, whatever all, is another business. Edutainment is another business, I didn't talk about that. Mobility is another business, and smart grids are in businesses of 10 billion each. What does that mean? Germany has less than 5% of the world's GDP. Yes, the gross do domestic product of Germany is less than 5% of the 75 trillion world's GDP. So if we take this market here, we have to say the world market is 20 times larger. The neighboring markets are at least so, the taking the whole value chain from silicon to systems to services is at least 10x larger, which means the total market that we're addressing with the tactile internet is more than a quarter of the world's GDP today. Yes, combine Germany and the US, 
GDP, total GDP, that's 20 trillion. It's a gigantic new industry to happen. And we can be part of it. And the silicon content here is probably on the order of one trillion. And the good news is, at least I say that as somebody that lives in Europe, is that it's all about embedded systems, real-time connectivity. So it has a lot to do with cyber-physical systems, industry 4.0, next generation, car to car, whatever, all these kind of things coming together. Yes? And Europe is a stronghold at that, as well as the US and Japan and South Korea. So there's a huge market opportunity for things to happen here, but we need a massive amount of semiconductor fabs to actually supply the silicon that is needed. It's a big step up. 2G was about voice and messages, 3D about data, 3G about data and positioning, 4G LTE is about video and everything, and 3D graphics, and 5G is the tactile internet plus more. And the world is going to change, and we're going to have fun. Thanks a lot for listening.